Well, we are live now. We're now we're now live. Say hello to everyone. Hello, everyone. <laughs> or welcome, if you will, to another Wednesday night uh, class discussion. We're glad that so many of you are joining us once again for our uh, series as we continue in the book of Romans. Uh, we're in chapter 12 of Romans, such a loaded, loaded chapter, a lot of good things that we've already talked about. But tonight as we kind of wrap things up in Romans chapter 12, I uh, want to talk about that whole idea of what do you do with your anger? Is it, is it proper to just give somebody a piece of your mind and to let them have what for? Or does the Word of God suggest that we take a different approach? Paul's going to talk about that a little bit tonight. You know what Mark Twain said about that? He had a good <laughs> bit of advice. What's that? He said, when angry, count four. When very angry, swear. <laughs> Well, See, you, you laughed. That's, I think he was uh, going for laughs. Okay, there. laughs. I don't right. think he was going for moral was, instruction. Wasn't literal intent no. on that. No, not at all. Well, let's get right into it this evening. Uh, if you're reading along at home, we're in Romans chapter 12 and picking up at verse number 14. Uh, and this is what Paul has to say. Bless them which persecute you. Bless, not curse. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger... Feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome with uh, evil. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Paul needs some help uh, organizing this material. <laughs> well, he's bunching a lot together. It's, it's a lot of food for thought. There. He's gone from several chapters just talking about things that nobody even knew what he meant. And now we know exactly what he means, and that's the yeah. problem. Well, that's the problem. That it's, is the uh, problem. Easy to say, easy to read, oh, hard goodness. to do, and yet this is the, the real challenge of Romans is putting it into practice. And uh, all of chapter 12, really, he's, he's given some practical advice on living the Christian life. But I think right here in this last section, man, he's really kind of laying the putting the rubber to the road. There's a saying, I wish I could remember who said it, but it, I think it was that sage anonymous, you know, you've heard, oh, anonymous, you, you, I've heard, you've of, heard of him mm -hmm. or her. And it says to live above with saints. We love. Oh, that will be glory <laughs> to live below with saints. We know. Well, that's, that's, another, that's story. another story. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and yeah. what he's saying here, verses 14 to the rest of the chapter is there's just a series of body blows as to what we need to do to fight the good fight yeah. in living the Christian life and in, in, in walking the walk and right. talking the talk. And That's there's it, so many things here. There's not really one sermon here. There's about a dozen. Oh, but let's go ahead and start at the beginning, which is always a good place to start and kind of wind through there and see maybe if we can shed a little bit of light. Yeah. on some really great advice. Just to remember what Paul is talking about in chapter 12, the difference between the world and, and yes. those that are part of the body of Christ. And he's talking about this whole, don't conform to the world and do things the way, be transformed. And That's part right. of that transformation is to get your thinking right. And part of that thinking then, how, how, it, how it plays out, this is what it looks like. Bless them which persecute you. And curse not. Wow. <laughs> Could you think of a better time to curse oh than when somebody is cutting you off, you're trying to merge, <laughs> and you're flying down the freeway at 60 miles an hour, and they won't let you in, and you turn over toward them and say, and God bless you. You know, we've taken the way of Christ, and we have basically neutralized it <laughs> to the point that everybody that you know is living the way of Christ. Everyone. Everyone in the world. Somebody said to me the other day, I was out on a visit, and they said, when's the last time that you've been to a funeral yeah. where the person wasn't going straight to heaven? Uh, looking down on us from a cloud of Playing skee-ball with Jesus yeah. in the heavenly arcade, even now. I mean, basically, anyone who's not a mass murderer <laughs> or a serial killer is walking the way of Jesus. And that's just nonsense, okay? Right. Most people in the world, 
don't give a, a flying fig about the way of Jesus. They don't think about it. And this is, part, this is partially why. Jesus is calling on us to do a lot of things that are unnatural, that are against our gate, yes. and that basically are offensive to us. Yes. This is a good place to start. Bless those who persecute you. And let's just knock the preacher voice off for a minute, yeah. which our brethren, John, love to do. Bless you, Brother yes, Monan. You know, yes. I'm like, like, dude, <laughs> shut up. Okay, but listen, what is he saying to do? He is saying you've got to return kindness when you receive unkindness. Yeah. When people lie about you, you've got to tell the truth. Yeah. When people have your worst, uh, uh, it, your, your worst uh, outcome in mind, you need to have their best outcome in mind. I John, I say when they go low, you go high. Somebody First, said that, that one time. I'm, in a different direction. I'm watching a show on the First Ladies right now. And, oh. and that, yeah, we haven't gotten to that part yet, but I think it's coming. Here's the thing. That's exactly what we're saying, and it's easy to say. It's really hard to do. Hard to do, man. It is hard to it do. Is. I can get in church and, you know, look at us. Nobody's throwing any things at us. Nobody's yeah. yelling at us. Nobody's calling us names. But then you get out there in the world and you got folks working against you and you got folks lying. You got yeah. folks scheming. And let's, let's know something here. This is not original with Paul. Thank you. Jesus was way ahead of Paul. I'm, I'm thinking the same thing. When Paul was going out and he was known as Saul and he was killing folk and trying to arrest folks, Consenting Jesus was putting Stephen. this into practice. Yeah, that's so, part and parcel of the teaching of Jesus. Right. But let's, let's make it full circle and bring the context back around. The context is the Christian life is countercultural. Yes. The, the, the Christian life and what Jesus taught about the kingdom went against the grain. And so Paul is simply echoing that, as, as Chuck just said, that here's what the Christian life looks like. If you're going to live sacrificially, and he's already said that in chapter uh, 12, verses 1 and 2, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Well, this is how you do it by being countercultural to what the world says, cuss them out, kick them in the shins. But as a Christian, we uh, humble ourselves to the, 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 the Lordship of Christ and we bless instead of curse. Now, let me tell you, mm. that, that in itself is a mouthful. Uh, Valerie was telling me uh, just yesterday, she had gone to the drugstore to pick up something and she stood in line while the little girl behind the counter was talking to one of her homegirls and Valerie said, and I don't think she's lying, she stood there 15 minutes oh waiting for them to finish a personal conversation while she was waiting to check out. That's unbelievable. And, you know, finally they, they noticed, oh, did you did you need something? Uh, yeah. I'd no, like I was waiting out. in line for my health. Yeah. That, that's what we were doing. And so it's those kinds of things that every single one of us uh, face in the world right. to a greater or lesser extent. And yet Paul is saying, as a Christian, when you have embraced uh, the lordship of Christ, the mind of Christ, then you do things differently. You bless them. And, that, and listen, if you don't get that the first time around or you don't get it the first hundred times around, don't despair, keep trying. That's one of those things, it might take a while because it is not natural to us. Not easy. It's not, not second natural. nature, yeah. not at all. Now notice in the next verse, he goes on and expands the circle a little bit more. Okay, it's one thing mm -hmm. to bless people that curse you. That's hard enough. Right. Now he's talking about people that maybe are neutral toward you, or maybe they're even for you. Yeah. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Yeah. Have you not found this the case, Brother Phillips, that most folks would rather go to a party than a funeral? <laughs> Uh, that, that most, I've noticed that phenomenon. Yes, uh, that, I have. That most folks would rather show up at, at, at Christmas morning to open presents or yeah. Thanksgiving to eat football and yeah. watch the Lions and the Cowboys lose yeah. than show up at Memorial Day. or so. I mean, that, that's just that's wired into us as been, well. There's been a lot of songs written about the good time Charlies. Uh, every, every, nobody, nobody loves you when you're down and out, you know. And so it's a part of the human psyche we like to be around the, the fun things but when when the tough times come uh, we kind of back away and distance ourselves Jesus found that to be true uh, it was a lonely place in the garden he wanted his his disciples to just watch and pray with him and even they didn't have the wherewithal to, to stick it through and so it's the same with us but I like 
what Paul is saying here, that part, as you just mentioned, of the Christian experience, when you fully embrace the mind of Christ, Chuck, there's a difference between sympathy, oh, I'm so sorry, oh, I feel so bad for you, oh, I'm sorry, and empathy, to come alongside and just sit there That's right. and just maybe weep. With like, a person. like Job's friends. I think so. Showed up for a week. You know, they come in for a lot of criticism because they start running their mouths about they things started that off good. they don't really understand, but they had good intentions. Yeah. They did. I mean, if somebody shows up with you for a week and is with you for a week, you couldn't get that out of most family members. Yeah, I, I think they started out good. And so Paul says simply this, that as we embrace the mind of Christ, as we understand our place in the body, how we relate to one another and to the world, we rejoice with those. There's a funny thing about the, um, just human psychology. Someone does good, okay, what was the, the lottery was up to 425, <laughs> and, and one person, I think yep. up in New York or something, won $425 million. You reckon there are a lot of people that are saying, yeah, that's great, I'm happy for you, or do you reckon there are a lot of people that are thinking, all right, you scoundrel, you, you, know, you don't deserve that, I should have won that. <laughs> Paul says, no, that's not the attitude. When someone has something to rejoice about, rejoice. as a Christian, you should be able to genuinely rejoice. And when someone is, is, is in sorrow, you ought to be able to come alongside, not looking down your nose in, in sympathy necessarily That's for right. them, but to empathize with them. Yeah, we had a, a, an occasion here at Pinnacle recently. <laughs> uh, my youngest son is, is getting married, yeah. and uh, Nathan and Kaylee had a wedding shower. Yeah. So a bunch of the sisters showed up at the wedding shower, and I've had so many people say something, oh, she's such a sweetie, and she is they're going to do so great, and yada, yada, yada. I can promise you that for the rest <laughs> of that young woman's life, when she becomes an old woman, she will never forget all the kindnesses that folks showed. Yeah. That's part of what's involved in rejoicing with those who rejoice. They've got a happy occasion. Join with them. Be with them. Think about this. Nobody who ever lived was busier than Jesus. Mm -hmm. But he had time to go to a wedding. He did. And a wedding then wasn't zip in, sit there for 30 minutes and zip out. It was a Big deal. two, three day affair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if Jesus can rejoice with those who rejoice, we can't. Here's the flip side of that. You also weep with those who weep. Yeah. When I was in Oklahoma City, we had a guy, a good friend of mine, a deacon. Now he's since become an elder. But... Uh, I'd noticed, you know, we, we had our share of funerals, and he hardly ever attended a funeral. I think I can remember two funerals while I was there he had actually gone to. Yeah. I came up to him and said something. I said, look, not for nothing. But? I said, you know, you're never at these funerals. This is a quote. <laughs> he said, well, see, I don't really like going to funerals. Yeah. I said, well, that's, that's strange. I love them. They're at the top of my list. Nobody likes them. And those. nobody likes them. Oh, I, I, but, but he'd had a, a, a sibling die. I said, was anyone there when your sister died? Oh, yeah, a lot of people. I said, that mean anything to you? Well, yeah. yeah. I said, it's going to mean something if you show up for them. Absolutely. And I think, just as an aside, um, we miss a golden opportunity, as Chuck is mentioning. When these things occur, it doesn't necessarily have to be a death in the family or a funeral or any type of a, a sad occasion. A sickness. Or sickness, rough period, loss of a job. Family uh, struggles. Struggles. Whatever it is. Any of those times. People uh, may not remember uh, what you say, but they will definitely remember your being there, you being a shoulder to lean on, uh, a listening ear. And so as Christians, Paul is simply stating the obvious. Listen, you want to you wanna show and exemplify right. the Christian life. Bless them that curse you. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. And then he kind of ties it all together. He says something very profound here in verse 16. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. <laughs> Professor Monan, I'm just a simple boy from the country. Help me to understand this. What does he mean, be of the same mind one towards another? Well, do we have any divisions in the world today? Afraid so. We do. And, you know, in, in the United States, we always tend, the first thing that we think of, as W.B.E. Du Bois said, is the problem of the 20th century is the color line. Mm. It's race. Mm. We always think race is the big divider. Race is not the big divider. No. Race is a divider. No. The biggest divider is money. 
Class. Class. Mm -hmm. There's no question. I mean, uh, what did F. Scott Fitzgerald say? The very rich <laughs> are different from you and me. Mm. Ain't it the truth? Yeah. Okay, you don't think that's the case? Wander into a place where, you know, the upper crust, is, you know, they'll, kind of, you know, they'll look at yeah. you like you're dirt on their shoes, okay? Yeah. The class line is always the biggest. Socioeconomic. Th that's it. It's economic more than it is socio. Most people think that, oh, you're from the north, I'm from the south. Oh, you're from this part of town, I'm from that. Those things, you know, can be worked out more or less. A, billi a billionaire the, from the north and, and the billionaire from the south have a lot more in common mm -hmm. with, with... It's economic. I, 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 that's it. So, that's it. I think you hit the nail on the head as Paul is talking about this. Well, wait a minute, Paul. I thought you were laying down Christian concepts. Well, he is. Yes. When you have the mind of Christ, when you have surrendered yourself, when you have been, uh, what's the Greek word, metamorpha, the, mm -hmm. you've been transformed, you begin to think things through differently. Um, who was it? I think it was Swindoll or someone said that what the world suffers from is not the, the pandemic of, of COVID. What the world is suffering from is the epidemic of stinking thinking. Mm. And let me tell you, we got some stinking thinking going on that begins to think that one person is different from another person right. simply because of their uh, bank account or because of where they live or the color of their skin. Car no, they drive, the car that they drive, the clothes that they wear, college they attended, or Any did they go to college? I, I, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And Be of the same mind. That's it. Don't Let, mind the high things. Condescend. Talk about that for a moment. Well, that's one of my favorite verses in the in the King James. It says, "Condescend to men of low estate." I just assume that means you need to be nice to people from Ohio. <laughs> And it probably does mean that. Probably does. Among other things. I mean, they're not all bad. Some of them are worth oh, man. knowing. Let me get this on tape. Did you say that? Not I said all some of them. Oh, I didn't okay, say all so. of them. All right, so all some right. of them. Here's what this means in practical terms. I, I, I told the story a while back, but some of you might not have gotten to hear it. When Ira North was a young preacher at the Madison, Tennessee congregation, he had an appointment to meet the richest person in Nashville, A.M. Burton, member of the church. No. He was the... He kind of helped found the Central Church of Christ. He was a huge contributor to David Lipscomb College at the time, to the Nashville Christian Institute, ah, which was Marshall Mark Keeble Keeble's School. Mm -hmm. So there's no telling how many young men that Burton educated, young women as well, uh, himself. But Burton was a huge philanthropist. And it's said that he was one of the few people, John, in the United States mm -hmm. that did not pay income taxes because he gave away so much money. Wow. And it exempted him from it. But wow. anyway, um, the, the young Ira North, the young preacher, comes into his office and Burton said, Son, let me ask you a question. And he said, Sure, yeah, sure. what is it? He said, When's the last time you preached on Romans twelve sixteen? Oh, yeah. And he had to admit, he said, I don't even know what Romans twelve sixteen is. He said, I do. He says, It says, Condescend to men of low estate. Right. He said, well, that, that's interesting. He said, son, that's more than just interesting. That's the Bible. That's what God's telling us. He said, I've got a list of these verses here. And he handed him a couple pieces of paper. All the verses that deal with this kind of thing, and I want you to read them. Mm -hmm. He said, well, yes, sir. I will go back uh, to my office and read them. He said, no, I want you to sit down and read them right oh, now. Oh, my. So he sat down there, and, and he told him, he said, if the Lord lets me live, I promise you next Lord's Day, I will preach on Romans 12, 16, and he did. But he said it made a big impression on him mm -hmm. because here is the guy that's got enough money. The, he could buy uh, and sell every person in town. Yeah. And what was he doing? He was finding ways to help those who were less fortunate. Yeah. Here's the key. The church is always at its best when it's bending over and helping yeah. someone. When it's doing something for someone in need. Not when we've turned this place into some religious country club yeah. and we're rubbing elbows with each other and we're associating with people yeah. of our status and our clique. And that, that's just, that's not church. Yeah. It's not church. And, and I think we need to be reminded, and we are, and, and as you said, um, many places in Scripture uh, bring home the same point. But, but definitely Paul is hammering home this idea. And remember now, he's talking in the first century to those on both sides of the coin, mainly the Jewish brethren, 
who would prop themselves up and say, oh, well, we are Abraham's children and we are members of the That's temple it. and da, 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 da. That's it. But Paul says, no, in Christ, there's neither high nor low, male nor female, Jew nor Greek. We have to have the mind of Christ, That's right. which is to not be wise in our own conceits, but to basically, as you said, humble yourself down and see us all on the same plane. So a very real challenge, even in these times that we live in. If we think that we're too good to speak to someone, to associate with someone, to eat with someone, uh, to spend time with someone because we're of a different <laughs> strata, we've completely missed the boat. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I've one of the things I've seen, I, I'm, I'm not saying it's isolated to this town. I'm saying this town's got more than its fair share of it. Yeah. You got people in the church who are respecters of persons. Yeah. There are certain people, they'll treat like the Aga Khan if they come in, but then a poor person wanders in or a day laborer or somebody yeah. that's barely making ends meet and nobody even notices them. One of the things that I love the most about the Pinnacle Church of Christ is I think that there's less of that yeah. here than any place I've seen. I, I think you're right. And it's, it has to be intentional. And, and again, uh, all of this is, is it's tough, right. easy to say, hard to do. Yes. Uh, but it is so very important because it screams to the world uh, what the church is all about. You mean this is what being a Christian is all about? Then I want no part of it. Or, mm -hmm. oh, so this is what being a Christian is all about, a place where everybody is loved and accepted. Everybody is striving right. uh, to, to uh, meet the high standard that the Lord sets down. And so... Paul really uh, lays down a very real challenge here in uh, verse 16. And then he says in verse 17, mm -hmm. uh, as if that were not enough, recompense no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. I, I, I get that. Verse 18, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you live peaceably with all men. I wonder why he put that little aside in there. I'll tell you why. Because okay. I think verse 18 is one of the most <laughs> brilliant bits of wisdom that you're going to ever receive in your life. And it will, give you, it will give you more peace in your own personal life than almost any other verse. Here's why. Here's okay. why I think he says this. You, you don't know a person. You can't find a person that doesn't have something that they struggle with in their life, some form of conflict. True that. I don't care who they are. I don't, they, they might be the single nicest human being. I've known a few. I know some in this church, and I guarantee you, they've had problems with their kids. Yep. They've had problems with a sibling. They had problems with the boss at work. They had problems with the neighbor. Something. You know, you, you, I, something, yeah. something, okay? Yeah. This is why this is key. I bet I quote this almost as much as I quote anything this side of Acts 2.38. And here, here's why. There are people w walking around thinking, well, man, you know, this, I'm trying. I've done everything yeah. I could. I have prayed for this person. Yeah. I, they have cursed me and I have blessed them. I put all mm -hmm. this into to practice and mm -hmm. we still don't get on very well. And I can still tell that there's conflict. Here's what it says. If... It is possible. Mm -hmm. Now, number one, it might not be possible. Uh, Chuck, it quite possibly may not be. It might not be possible. Yeah. There's some things that are not possible. <laughs> you know, for, forget Norman Vincent Peale for just a second. <laughs> Sometimes certain things are not possible. Yeah. Okay, secondly, as far as it depends on you, right. there is a nugget of truth in that. Okay, well, it might be, John, there's somebody out there that I could get along with me, and they're not going to get along with well, you. Chuck, listen, shake my hand. And let's put all these things to rest. Shake my hand. I can't do it. Shake my hand, brother. <laughs> uh, that's what I'm saying. Go By the way, the you know why? You know why they first start shaking hands? I got to show you in medieval times. There's not a weapon in my hand. Oh, okay. I'm not going to kill you. Oh well. It's like, isn't that nice to know? Okay. But yes, okay. I've reached out to you, and you don't want you anything don't want, to do that, with that's me. That's it. I think that's the part about if it be possible, and as much as it that's lies it. to you, when you extend the hand to fellowship, and somebody spits in it. That's it. That's about all you can do. There are some people that do not want peace. There are some people that are impossible to live in harmony with. God's not going to hold you responsible, responsible for that. God's going to hold you responsible for your reaction. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Well, you say, well, they don't want to live at peace with you. Well, then you're freed from your that part. responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. That is, and that is so helpful because Christians are great at internalizing and dragging after them guilt. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, but my... My, my sister-in-law 
has never warmed to me. Well, whose fault is that? If you've done everything that you could, if yeah. you've been kind. One of the it, devil's chief weapons, Chuck, is that guilt, a guilty conscience. Mm-hmm. But uh, Paul um, does a masterful job in, in at least giving us that. Oh, he was a member of the Sanhedrin, so I guess he knew about loopholes. Um, verse 19, as we kind of close this out. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. Mm. Do not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's talk wow. about that as we close out. Um, this whole idea of revenge and, and, and anger and what to do with it. I think you said just a moment ago. There's not a Christian alive that has not had some type of conflict. And if you haven't, live on, you will. But what do you do with that? First of all, is it is it a sin to get angry? No. In your anger, do not sin. That's Bible. Do not let the sun go down in your anger. Okay, here's the difference between our anger generally and Jesus's anger. Jesus got angry when innocent people were being hurt and manipulated. Mm-hmm. We get angry when our sense of honor is offended. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of this really, really long book. It's like 34 hours on Audible. Oh it's called uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined by evolutionary psychologist mm. Steven Pinker. Here's something that's really interesting about this. I mean, you didn't ask for this. This is a bonus. If you get the DVD of this, this is on the bonus track. Okay, extra, extra. Pinker was comparing, and this is a stereotype, but it generally holds true. He said in the South, this culture of chivalry and honor became so intense Mm -hmm. that if anyone offended you or anyone insulted you, you know, we we must duel. (laughs) Whereas generally in the North, like ah, Eh, shut up, you know, eh. they just walk off and they didn't really care. And they were trying to figure out why that is. And this this is what the guy said. One theory, okay, it's not the gospel truth, but just one theory. He said, most of the folks that settled in the South were Uh Scots-Irish, and a lot of them were herdsmen. Okay, they herded sheep, or they herded cows, or whatever they had, and all this. And when all your wealth is bound up in something that has feet and can walk away, or can be led away by somebody else, you're always nervous about that. And you would dispense justice in, you know, cattle rustlers, what they do in the western they, they they hung them shot they them shot them fight. okay yeah. they didn't fool them but he said there was something about that in the south well i think that that's become intensified go sure. down to the modern day we mentioned this in a sermon a while back you got all these knuckleheads that are out there shooting each other and having gunfire and i saw on the news the other night oh, yeah. two cars at a park that's you know right. they, they start shooting each other in like 15 rounds i'm like why yeah. why i guarantee you somebody said something that the other one didn't like and therefore, this I must. That's how we got to settle it. Yeah. That's exactly what Paul is saying not to, <laughs> to do, do here. Yep. He says, "Look, you might have a legitimate beef. You probably don't, don't, but let's say that you do. Turn it over to God, because if all you do is think, I'm going to spend the rest of my time thinking and plotting about this, and I'm going to get even. Okay, for the chucklehead that shot whoever, and, and they get arrested." They're going to get even? No, they're going to go to prison, and they're going to mess up their life, and they're going to be in there for a long time. Okay, here's the second thing. If I'm thinking about this all the time and thinking about it and thinking about it, John, there's somebody over there, and they did something to me, and I'm never going to forget. How am I going to get him back? Guess what? They're not even thinking about that right now. They're not thinking about me. They've moved on. They don't care. But I'm just obsessing over this, and I'm dwelling on this. Anne Lamott had a great line. She said, Plotting revenge and always trying to get even with people. She said, that's like eating rat poison and waiting for the rat to die. To die. Yeah. You're going to die. It's going to kill you. And that's what Paul's trying to say. Turn this over to God. God sees this. And, and look, if there's a passage that hits me flush between the eyes, it's this one. I have, I think, a pretty keen sense of justice. Mm. I hate lying. I can't stand liars. I've seen a lot of this kind of stuff, yep. even in the last several years. And I'm like, they got to get what's coming to them. They got to get what's coming to them. Hold the phone. Take a deep breath. Yeah. They're going to get what's coming to them. Right. Paul says this yeah. right now. Yeah. Vengeance is mine. I, I will. will repay, yeah. says the Lord. Yeah. Not says Chuck or yeah. says John. And, you know, you know something about this. You've suffered pretty mm. egregiously. Have you spent the rest of your life 
I'm going to find that person. I'm going to eat. I mean, you know, there are cultures in the world. Probably the best one is Albania. They have something called the canon that was written in the 15th century by a nobleman named Lech Dukagini. And they have, th this is fascinating, they have codified revenge down to the nth degree. If someone spits on you, you do this to them. Yeah. If they bump you walking down the street, you do that to them. If they insult your mother, you do this. If they, you know, uh, uh, attack your sister, I mean... And most of these things end up in blood duels, yeah. and they will kill each other. Yeah. And I'm thinking, this is ostensibly a Christian society. They consider themselves, the ones that aren't Muslims, Christians. Yeah. And I'm like, there could be nothing less Christian than just burning with revenge and waiting to get even with yeah. somebody. A couple, two things. Um, learn to forgive. Uh, leave it up to the Lord. Uh, you'll save a whole lot of time, and you'll feel a whole lot better. Number two. Paul gives the answer to what do you do with with that pent up sense of misguided, you know, vengeance. Here's what you do. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. Gives you something to do. It gives you the upper hand. But I think Paul has something else in mind. It also puts a little something on their mind. It makes them wonder, what's this dude up to? If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Gives you something to do. You've taken the high road, but it puts something on his mind. And then in, in closing, Paul says this, In doing so, thou shall heap coals of fire on his head. Now, now, Chuck, I know you've heard this too. I've heard some ridiculous explanations of this. Well, you see, back in the first century, there was this <laughs> thing, and people you know, didn't have central heating, and they would go around with a big bowl on their head, and if you really wanted to help them, you would scoop out some coals out of your furnace and drop it down out of the window and heap coals on their head. No, no, and a thousand times no. That, that may have happened, but that's not what Paul was talking about here. I think he's talking about the psychological effect. You're going to mess with them. You're, gonna, you're going to do something, and yet it is, it is in keeping with what the mind of Christ would be. You help your enemy, and they can't quite figure out what's going on here. Don't be overcome with with evil, but you overcome that evil. You with think good. about someone that learned from someone who learned from someone about this. Okay, Jesus, Jesus is the one putting this wow. into practice. Wow. And then 19 centuries later, you got Gandhi doing it over in wow. India. And then there was a young cat that was a, a doctoral student at uh, Boston University named, named Martin King. Yeah. And he learned from Gandhi, who learned from Jesus, nonviolence, the principle of nonviolence. Do you know what basically flipped the script and what finally turned the tide a hundred years after the Civil War and it should have solved all this and it didn't? When you see on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, you know, Martin Luther King and John Lewis and you know, so others, others yeah. walking and they're peaceable and they're being assaulted and all this, you think, no, wait a second. These people are responding with violence, and how are these people treating them in return? Mm -hmm. They're not retaliating. Right. They're not hitting back. I think it was Stokely Carmichael that said, Dr. King, <laughs> why are you expecting black folks to be more moral than white folks? And that was probably the wrong question. Here's the question. The question <laughs> you is... You had to know Stokely. Here's the, Stokely had some other <laughs> <Yeah>. questions. <laughs> the, the question is this. Did Paul know what he was talking about? Yes, he did. Did Jesus know what he was talking <laughs> Absolutely. about? Absolutely. You are going to get farther with a person instead of just going hand-to-hand -hand combat yep. and bullet for bullet and gun for gun. When someone is treating you in a horrible, shabby way, that you take the high road. Yep. Because you're, you're sending a message to them. What do those people have that I don't have? That's it. You know, all I want to do is, is maim and hurt and kill. And those folks... They have my best interest at heart. What, what's something the difference? Something about the Christian, something about yes. living the Christian life. You're not only dealing with your personal situation, but you're changing the dynamic. You're, you're, I hate to use the word paradigm shifting. You are. But you're changing that because of the way that you live. And so Paul is really challenging not only the people of his day here in, in chapter 12, but down the tunnel of time, it is a, a um, challenge to us today to look at how we are living and to begin to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. Nothing says that we have the mind of Christ more 
than how we treat those who are um, mean-spirited absolutely and hateful to us don't be overcome with evil but brother let's overcome you know evil. one of the one of the shifts in, in modern America in the civil rights movement happened when we just described what the events of Selma were right. well that weekend a lot of Americans see you guys with 800 channels don't remember this you young you young punks don't know this. Back in the day when we were kids, you had three, had three channels and maybe you got lucky and had PBS. PBS but there was nothing on PBS. So three channels. Well, one of the shows, the movies that was on, everybody was watching, was a movie called Judgment at Nuremberg. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about the... the the persecution of the Nazi war criminals, people that were murdering yep. millions of people that were burning people up in crematoria. Mm. Okay, so while people are watching this, you know, we've got a, a breaking news and they come in with a bulletin. What we're doing. It's like we're watching the Nazis and how horrible they are and they're like, wait a, wait, wait a second. So we've got folks that are kind of treating folks like the Nazis treated the Jews. And yeah. I mean, sometimes when you refuse to retaliate, that sends a more powerful message than when you do. Absolutely. It just does. Paul uh, wraps it up. He says, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome the evil with good. Mm. Um, That's powerful. It is. Hopefully we can do that. And hopefully you are uh, finding that to be true in your life. We appreciate you tuning in this evening for another Wednesday night uh, midweek class discussion. Come on out and be with us. Uh, whenever you can, we'd love to have you here at the Pinnacle Church of Christ. Indeed. Chuck, lead us in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for all of the wisdom that we see here in the words of Paul. We know, Father, that the Holy Spirit inspired him to, uh, to write these things down for our benefit for centuries later. And Father, we realize that in this world, we will have trouble. Mm. We'll have struggles. We'll have obstacles to overcome. But Father, we see the way forward in these wise, wise words of counsel. Father, help us to overcome evil with good. Help us to bless and not curse. Help us to be willing to condescend to men of low estate. Help us not to think more highly of ourselves than we should. Father, help us, in short, to be like Jesus and to walk in his footsteps, to follow his example. And Father, we pray for all who are listening tonight uh, that something that has been said it can spur something in us to be the kind of people that you want us to be, to overcome uh, evil with good, to be able to work on those flaws that we see in ourselves and that we can grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.